Uh, and what a year it's been. I mean, this has been a year unlike um, any other. And uh, from my perspective, the disruption and the change has created in our world for a big corporation like ours with huge brands and reaching many consumers is it's, it's created an agility that I think uh, we were aspiring to have, but it sort of forced it. So I think that's certainly one of the positives that came out of it. But COVID really resulted for us in a real-time focus on the consumer and how Frito-Lay could make people people's lives better. And it really starts with our purpose. And, you know, we've been talking for a while about what is the purpose that we serve. And our mission as PepsiCo and Frito-Lay is to create smiles. But what really creates a smile uh, through our brands. And we truly landed on this notion that yes, we sell snacks and we make great tasting snacks that satiate consumers. But truly, I talk about us being in the business of joy. We transform many moments of joy every day for many people on, in many moments. Um, and when we step back and we said, wow, if our purpose is joy, gosh, does the world need joy now more than ever? And we were at the time a year ago, our brands and our products were deemed as essential. So we really made a pivot and we said, well, our purpose has never been more relevant. So we're gonna lean into that and that's gonna drive everything that we do. But we also switched our mindset and we said, well, we're essential. So what does that mean? That means we don't go, we're not just about selling anymore, we're about serving. We're about moving from a sell to a serve mindset. And so all of our efforts became about people, about communities, about making sure we could serve in the best possible way. And we needed to do that as well because people were looking at us to trust us. You know, they trust us incredibly. And it was amazing to see how consumers were concerned that, you know, they wouldn't have access to us. Uh, to the products that they love. And so it really made us step up and think about how important it is to deliver on that brand trust and how to really deliver for communities at this time. And so, you know, it forced us into that mindset. We took a much more active role. We leaned into our purpose like never before. And, you know, we really acknowledged the role that we were serving at the time. And at the same time, really listening to the consumer like never before so those are that was kind of uh you know the context for what was happening and what drove us and then you know i just highlight what did that change for us what what sort of initiatives came out of that mindset well first and foremost we said if we're going to serve and we're essential we got to make sure that consumers can get access as easy as they can so within a month we launched uh, snacks.com, which is a direct to consumer uh, way of accessing our products. They could get them within two days and they could get access to the portfolio. So I just use that as an example of how we leaned into joy, we leaned into our purpose and that really is guide us. And frankly, that's, if anything, something that we will continue to double down on um, in the future. Yeah, no, absolutely. I love that. It sounds so simple, it, but it's really resonates, right? Simple joys and the fact that people need it now more than ever. Um, even in your recent campaigns, there's something on now like the let's summer and how we yes. need to take the idea of two summers into one um, yes. and how chips and dips and, you know, crunchy, salty snacks are like a critical component of how we define summer, right? And everything else. So um, I love all of that. It's it's bigger than it sounds, but in a lot of ways, it's very simple and yeah. And real, right? and I, yeah. And I would just, I mean, well, thank you for noticing that. We we love that. Um, we love oh, that. I, that, love, that, I that, also love yeah. the music on the campaign. It sort of it really fits the tone. So I, I, yeah. I forgot the name of the artist. I actually looked it up, but um, but yeah, and, she captured the whole thing. And I would just say that I I talk about this a lot. I say we may be humble snacks but we do have this big purpose in the everyday um, because truly those little moments. And as you're saying, take summer as an example, gosh, are people uh, wanting to come back together to want to really celebrate. And if we can play a small humble role in that, uh, then, then, then that's what we'll do. And so um, that's exactly how we think about it. We smiles. How do we do that every day? And, you know, I think this, pandemic has really helped us learn how to appreciate the simpler things 
in mm-hmm. life and, uh, and, and our little simple humble snacks uh, uh, have, have helped those mini moments. And uh, so we, uh, we, we feel you know, proud, I think, that we've been able to serve that role uh, during this uh, pandemic. Yeah, no, it, it makes a lot of sense. Um, the next topic I would say is really along the lines of those consumer trends that have come out of 2020. You know, the fact that we are appreciating the simpler things in life, obviously, is is one of them. What are some others that you feel have really emerged um, coming out of the past year and even maybe years prior? Yeah, you know, it's interesting. I think, frankly, we're still discovering them. And I'll give some specific examples of the ones that we have seen. But what I would say is that the environment has never been more changing, more fluid, more dynamic. And what that means from from my perspective is dynamism in marketing. It truly is about dynamic marketing more than ever. The rate of change has never been greater. Agility has never been more uh, needed. And it's this reappraisal that I mentioned, I think has created as a trend and an expectation that consumers are really looking for us to play an active role in serving communities and in their daily lives in whatever way they need you to and how it manifests itself. There's far more scrutiny now on what you are doing than what you are saying and what you are doing that matches what you are saying. And consumers call you out more than ever. And so the expectations have changed. The expectations are higher authenticity is paramount, brand trust is paramount. So COVID has really proved to us, I think, that consumers expect brands to take an active role and serve the communities that support them. And so, you know, we've really been thinking about how do we uh, lean into some of these, um, some of these changes and these trends. And whilst there is going to be some return to you know previous behaviors the consumer has evolved into this new normal and we're really uh continuing i think to build capabilities that allow us to listen and learn quickly and help that inform and redirect uh the actions that we take because of this notion of high expectation, authenticity, and dynamism that we're seeing uh, in the external environment. Yeah, um, I, I love this, and I love the you know the actions speak louder than just the words and the awareness. Yes, we are all so much more in tune to you know systemic racism and the needs to make it part of the conversation and inclusivity and diversity, but also the uh, you know community impact and sustainability and the notion of sustainability. And there's such a wide spectrum of really important things to talk about. But what I feel Frito-Lay and PepsiCo have been doing in general really well is taking action on those things and sharing with their consumers the stats and the actions taking and the fact that progress and doing is a lot more important than just talking about it. one example of this, I think we alluded to it when, when we chatted prior, was your AAPI initiative around starting from the inside out and how you took your employees and spoke to them and decided how you were going to approach it. Can you share a little bit on, on that initiative, a little bit with everybody? Yeah, absolutely. I'd be happy to. And, and, and I have to say, I mean, you've taken a lot of actions over the course of the last year and even prior to, you know, some of the catalytic catalytic effects we saw in um, in in the world but um, I uh, I really believe that one of the things that has come out of all of this um, increased expectation is that you you cannot look at it without really internalizing it you can be a part of it if you don't internalize it within your organization and in your beliefs and in truly how you think about things and how you act And so when I thought about this in the case of the AAPI community, I I said, if we're going to live our purpose, we need to do so from the inside out. And we need to stand up when we see injustice happening, not just because it's the right thing to do, but because we need to stand up on behalf of our incredible people. Because this, we're all people. 
And our employees are the people that we're talking about as well um, in our external um, environment and communications. And so, um, and we're very proud of our employees at Frito Lay and PepsiCo family. And you know, they really are, um, they really are uh, the kind of greatness that you see in the world on the brands, they truly are the ones that make that happen. But the recent Asian hate crimes were very upsetting to our leadership and our employees. And I think I mentioned to you, Gem, when we spoke, we'd set up this cultural council, which was volunteer based, um, which was really representing all ethnicities across our team. And it was really, uh, they were there to help guide us and, and educate us uh, on how people were feeling. And so we, we decided we wanted to find a way to offer a safe space for our employees to share their reactions and to experience, you know, the internal dialogue. What were people saying? How are they feeling? And so we had this virtual round table because we're still virtual, um, but it was an incredible experience because we heard frankly devastating stories of their own experiences of discrimination, what it felt like to be Asian American. And it was truly an eye-opening experience for, for everyone. And I came out of that session, session really thinking about, well, if we're gonna live this purpose on the outside, in, inside, we've got to live it on the outside and that's got to connect. And so we decided we wanted to do something to support this group. So within two weeks, we put a campaign in partnership with Viacom that featured our own employees. So they kind of, they're kind of famous now, but they were, they were, it was amazing because we were able to really tell the story from the inside out. And they talked about what it meant for them to be Asian and American, which was all part of a larger initiative that we were doing as PepsiCo to contribute a million dollars in support to the Asian American community. But they were featured, exactly. they they're told their, all, their own story. Doing you're doing that's behind all of the awareness. I mean, like you just quickly mentioned it, but it's with everything that you guys are putting out there as a brand, you also have action behind everything. Yeah. And that's it. very much the shift that we've made. It's no longer what you say, it's what you do. And do you match up to those actions? It, it, does your actions match up to what you say? You quickly found out the, the you know, the sensitivity measure and consumer environment has never been greater on that. Um, so that was what we did and the reaction externally was very positive and we were happy about that but honestly the most rewarding thing was the internal reaction was overwhelming and even more gratifying and you know the personal notes I received and just the conversation um, internally was incredibly uh, rewarding because we truly were living it from the inside out. Mm. And that's a trend obviously that you because of the gratification because of the success and how good it and authentic it feels will continue into the future obviously so um i love hearing about that i touched over community impact and a lot of the things that you guys are also doing free delay is doing to support local communities with regards to even like soccer programs and supporting um you know black owned businesses and lots of you know big and small efforts can you touch a little bit on the community impact and how the brand sort of is using that and its strategies moving forward? Yeah, absolutely. I think, you know, the, the relationship is so um, back and forth and that, you know, we are very grateful for the fan base that we have. And we truly have these incredible fans that love our brands with their household names. And we're in 94% of households. And when you think about that, that's kind of, that's kind of mind blowing actually. But what we quickly realized is that it is a relationship that, that is based on a bond that is about them enjoying us, but what are we doing then to give back? And how do we support and grow local communities? And when you are a company like ours that's truly all over the US, you know, you absolutely are touching so many communities at scale it really uh, does uh, let us uh, think about how do we really um, go much further um, than that. And so things like meal donations that we did on the onset of the pandemic, then building purpose more into the brands that allows us to sponsor uh, programs. You know, one thing that we did, um, which was really amazing was uh, when we, um, 
partner with BET around Doritos Amplify Black Voices. Uh, we created a long-term partnership with Black Lives Matter to shine the spotlight on Black artists who are fighting for racial justice. So we actually handed over our outdoor advertising so that they could um, create their, um, it would give them a voice and they could create art and to express themselves. And that we put up across major cities across the US. So another example of kind of how we're supporting different types of communities. And then, um, you know, a lot of efforts around uh, sustainability, just um, even within the Super Bowl, uh, we'd leaned in much more to in our um, classic Super Bowl moments into giving people a moment of release from what is a very tense and anxious time. But we also complemented that with um, uh, a meal donation program where we were sending meal kits um, to as many people as we could. So those are just some of the examples um, of the work that we've done. But, you know, I really think it's so important to value the relationship that you have with your consumer such that it is kind of a positive spiral of yes uh we are grateful for how you enjoy us and here's how we give back in support of the things that you care about and i think staying very close to what communities care about is something that we're doing much more listening and learning about yeah, no, that's interesting. And you're taking that feedback, obviously, and using a lot of that and those tactics to shape, you know, how you move into, you know, some of the, the ways you communicate to your customers in the future, which is really, which is really great. Um, you know, the next thing is really staying focused on the consumer, right? The consumer is more in control than ever before, specifically in regard to how they sort of receive your and how and when they receive your brand message, right? And how they engage with it. How do you guys plan your media to really sort of fit into the consumer and how they're engaging with your messaging now? Well, it's a really interesting time because uh, there's been an acceleration in so many different things, whether it's, you know, people's uh, subscribing to uh, OTT and new subscription services that are, you know, because people were at home so much. And one of the things I would say, you mentioned, you, you asked me earlier, Jen, about trends. I mean, home as the hub is going to continue. Yes, people's mobility is increasing, but this notion that home is the new hub. And of course, you know, all of these, uh, because of that, it, it, you know, it has changed the way people are consuming media. So we are seeing, um, the eyeballs moving into OTT, into new ways of, of uh, consuming content and, you know, broadly uh, how they're entertaining themselves. And actually one of the learnings that we had um, in this crisis beyond just the serve mindset and making sure that we were really uh, providing consumers with what they want about, our, what they love about our brands is we also took on a bit of a role in entertainment. And we said, actually, we can, yeah, brands are in joy. They are truly fun. And, you know, and a lot of times uh, we know that uh, they can spark a moment of transition, emotional transition, where people can take a moment, maybe uh, they're feeling stressed and they can feel excited. And so we said, well, how can we lean into that entertainment um, mindset across what we do? And so things like, how people are using mobile, how they're engaging in the social world. And so we've been expanding in those areas, but really I think trying to see where the, the eyeballs are going, what sort of content is really engaging consumers? How do we think about being more of an entertainment system across media versus just how we would typically plan media um, has been a bit of a shift for us. And, um, and you know, we're still also evaluating where's it going? You know, where, where is it going in the next five years? And how do we look ahead to that? And I think one of the big changes from a media landscape perspective that we've seen is retailer media networks because e-com has accelerated massively. And you've got that dimension of where consumers truly are shopping now, and that's gonna influence how we surround them with our um, content and our messaging and communications. But in addition to that, 
the expectations in digital have gone up because what's interesting around how digital marketing and digital experiences in general have democratized across many, many age groups, many, many types of consumers, that what that makes you realize is that their experience, because it's been so much more digital and so much more digitally enabled, they have expectations now of what those digital experiences need to be. And I think we are now trying to innovate more and raise the game in how we create experiences in our brands. And I'll give you an example of what we did at Super Bowl this year, where we wanted to create an interaction for consumers at home. And so we partnered with Snapchat where on Cheetos, you could actually um, snap to steal a bag of Cheetos from the Super Bowl commercial <laughs> while it was running. And it's kind of, I know this sounds totally crazy. And uh, we had 50,000 bags stolen. And I think it's the first example of truly, you know, taking the engagement and the experience up because this is what uh, people are expecting. And they're being very discerning about where they create their platforms, where they choose, what content they're leaning into. And so expectations have gone up in that space as well. And it's just far more democratized than it's ever been. Yeah, absolutely. And then you think about all of the different brands, right? I mean, everything from more mature giant brands, the Lays, the Ruffles, the Cheetos to maybe, and then you have maybe a little bit more niche, although they all seem to be pretty, pretty big, but things like, you know, what is it? Simply and smart food. And so how do you give everybody proper attention and, and proper communication in the right place at the right time? Yeah. And you throw in all the fun new things like the bold and spices or like the limited edition flavors and the things that probably are resonating with your younger audiences to sort of create experiences around them and engage with your customers. Um, I keep reading a lot about the new flavors. I have two young boys at home and they're big gamers and they are always very in tune to all of the new hot and spicy chips that they want me to buy for them. So can you speak a little bit about the younger generations and some of the fun things that you guys are doing with the brands to maybe reinvent or cultivate young yeah. audiences and conversations? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think, you know, first and foremost, what we know is that 82% of this generation are skipping ads. So you have to be more innovative in the way you think about connecting with them and, and making them aware of these kinds of uh, new, new innovations or new kinds of snacking um, products that we're developing all the time. Um, and so you've got to live on more innovative platforms. Um, and especially if you want to get to these early adopters, because they very much are at the forefront of where um, the digital space is going. And so these are, you know, and we know that 70% consume content on mobile. So what that also just, you know, in the way you create content, if I'm looking at it on my, on my big screen, I'm not in their world. So how do you even evaluate what works and, and what's needed? So these types of insights have really driven us to think about how we market when and where and how to stay in lockstep with the audiences. And, you know, uh, a couple of examples of, of things that we've done in this space is, you know, for this generation, particularly, if you think about Gen Z, they are truly, um, motivated by self-expression. It's really important to them as younger consumers. And you see that in the platforms themselves, whether it's the latest TikTok challenge or however they can express themselves in, in their way. And they're looking at brands that really appreciate that. And so we're trying to nurture those platforms to be a part of and for have these consumers be a part of the innovation that we do. And so when we were launching our another level um, creative strategy for Doritos, we actually said, well, you know, if they're skipping ads, just doing an ad is probably not uh, the way to go. And so we actually kind of created the anti ad where we created a brandless campaign and we handed over our platforms. Um, you know, all that we had on the, on the Instagram page was kind of a, a triangle of the Doritos triangle. So we truly went brandless and then we asked them to sort of create on our behalf. And we said, Hey, how do you show your love for Doritos? 
and uh, and go ahead and create. And that is an example, I think, of where we're really um, leaning into this generation. We're trying to understand what they value, and then we're trying to be much more consumer in into how we think about the creative and the content and then handing over some of the creativity to them so they can express themselves because that's what they value yeah no i i love that and it makes a ton of sense how much of a role does um your consumer data i know you guys have a lot of internal platforms and analytics running that sort of cultivates that for you what is the role of data in, in helping you do the best job you can with something like that well, it, it's never been more critical. And I think, you know, we're on a journey here. I mean, the reality is we have a lot of data. I think what we're trying to do is really connect it, trying to dig for insights that truly can transform what we do and trying to be as real time as we can to learn. And that is really the challenge that we have and, and how do we harness that? So there's a lot of things that we've done. I mean, this. First of all, I mentioned snacks.com. That's a direct to consumer site. We have a direct relationship now with the consumer in transactions, as well as in, you know, ways in which we can learn and, and test things with them and get insight. Um, in addition, we have, we launched a tasty rewards program, which is a loyalty program, another way in which we are, you know, leveraging our relationships to create more insight and more data. And I would say, you know, we, we are definitely on a journey. Obviously, a lot is changing in the environment and we're having to learn how to, you know, uh, pivot through these times. But I would say it's ever more critical. We are absolutely leaning in. And then I think what we're trying to really work through is what are the capabilities in-house that we really, really need to create that agility and that dynamism? And I'll give an example, not necessarily on the data side, but on how we think about content and how we're thinking about bringing our brands to life and taking those actions that we talked about earlier. And we have an in-house agency and we pivoted in the last year. Um, and, and, you know, I'm super proud this week we were the in-house agency. Of year. Sorry, I got a name drop, not for me, for my team, because I'm so proud of them. They did, they've done such an awesome job, but a part of, of where that, you know, that was one of the very thoughtful things that we've had is to say we have internal folks who have internal connectivity to the data, to the insights, to how the brands are thinking. How do you leverage that more and create more impact with that? And, you know, super proud that, you know, of the work that's come out of the, of the last year, all driven through the purpose leaning into the purpose and thinking about how to leverage it. But that's an example of how we're thinking about how do we start to harness some of the power of the data, translate it quickly, have impact. And I will tell you every single thing, the examples of campaigns that we did there or activations we did were done in record time, like faster than ever before. And that is the, that is some of the difference that, we can create with the power of the data that we're gathering now. Yeah, I, I have to agree with that, Rachel, in such a strong way on the ampersand side as well. I mean, the idea of data cadence and agility and being able to have for, for us second by second viewership insights to have that agility to sort of make sure things are relevant, make sure you're adjusting campaigns, making sure you're doing what you need to do to, you know, talk to your consumers in the best possible way and to deliver those messages as, you know, as quickly and as efficiently as possible. So um, I think that the trend of, of data and really agility and speed, right, into the future is, is a really critical topic in general. And I think something that we will be hearing more and more on as we yes. move forward and as a technology moves faster along with all of us, I think it'll be um, great to be fast with data and yeah. applications for sure. I, yeah, I would just add one point, which is it's really important that we have that as the foundation, but we absolutely have to continue to elevate the purpose of the brand and connect it back to that because 
it's so, so important. There's lots of pipes now, as I talk about it, in very simple terms uh, in my technology brain. But there's so <laughs> many more pipes. There's so many more places to touch the consumer. But the reality is what you put in those pipes is still really, really important. And the data has to translate to deep and meaningful insights that connect with that purpose to really leverage the most out of the data and the most out of the the more sophisticated media and connections plans we need to have. Yeah, to stay connected to the, to the why the entire yeah. time, right? And then to make sure that once you collect all those data points, you still are connected to the why and the main objective. Absolutely. And a lot of the time with, with that is, you know, really identifying that objective and the meaning up front, right? And staying yeah. true to it and not going off course. Because I'll give you an example. We we found, you know, through the through doing some really deep analysis um, uh, in the social space that, you know, consumers like us to create fake flavors, which I find just like a fascinating thing. And so we started doing this and it was incredible, uh, the engagement. And so I use that as an e example of kind of when you're really mining the data and you're looking at where centers of gravity are in conversation, and, but then you get to the, the why behind it, it can then power up some really creative ways of um, engaging them because it is also, it is always the scarcity, the, um, uh, uh, the creativity around flavor within our category and taste is king. It just, it's amazing how it can manifest itself in different ways and how you can use that as, as a way of truly, you know, delighting your fans in a non-tangible way. So that's, you know, that's fascinating. Yeah, it's really very interesting. A lot of it probably has to do with the, the difficulty to get it and the mystery, right? Um, for, sure. for sure. No, absolutely. <laughs> I think I see some questions in the in the chat. Um, I'm looking about. I'm trying to open them so I can see them clearly. But um, I'm taking a look, and it says, "How do you define purpose-driven marketing, and how are you bringing that to life?" And I know we talked about a bunch of examples, but um, maybe some more specifics around around that. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, one thing I want to be clear on is that. We don't see purpose as it's just about societal role and societal impact. We think that's an aspect to it, but truly the purpose comes from that deep and meaningful truth around why does your brand exist? What role does it serve in people's lives? However great or small that is, and truly based on an, a big insight that translates to you resolving a tension and that resolution of that tension is what yields the purpose and so as Frito-Lay as a whole that's where we you know why we talk about transforming moments of joy why because what we know is that when people consume our brands they experience an emotional transformation and it's it may seem small but it's meaningful at that moment and it's transient it doesn't last but it's a a moment and it creates memories and it creates moments of joy that are connected to and that's why people will tell you stories about when they first ate lace or memories they have of lace or memories of the holidays and so um, that's how we think about it and um, and then we really respect what that role is um, and so yes we are not sending people to mars but what we are doing is creating a mini moment of joy uh, when they are experiencing uh, these products and these uh, brands. And, um, and that's how we define it. And there is a lot of purpose in these small moments, um, but we are really um, using that as our guardrail for how we think about purpose. Yeah. No, I, I, I love that. And it is, it's simple, but it is meaningful. I keep going back to the last summer, I guess, because it's current. But I think one of the taglines is your favorite people and your favorite snacks, right? And that whole idea is simple. I'm thinking about summer and thinking about being with people you like and being outside and having Tostitos and salsa. It's, it's, it all goes hand in hand. It's about hitting that the right way so that when people think about the brand, they associate it with that moment. Yeah. Um, and I, it's, and I don't, it's, it sounds simple and I'm sure it's not always simple to keep that 
and new and current. No, it's not. And, you know, it's interesting because, you know, we have a spectrum around how we do think about purpose as well. So we, we, we think that there's that purpose that translates into the moment. And then there's that broader purpose about how can you serve the community and how can you uh, support uh, things that your consumers care about. And, and we have such a range of portfolio. I mean, we have 30 brands in the portfolio. It's an incredible, uh, incredible house of brands, really. But I take Stacey as an example. In that brand, what we found is because it was invented by a female founder, a talented, commi- uh, um, committed and passionate uh, uh, female who wanted to create this delicious uh, snack and uh, well, it's more than a snack, it's used uh, for many occasions. Yeah. Um, but that bore life to Stacey's. And we said, gosh, the truth behind that brand is it came from a founder who wanted to make a difference. And how can we then lean in to support other female founders? And that led to the Stacey's Rise program. And so that's an example of, you know, the purpose is really uh, comes from the true story of the brand and the narrative behind the brand and what the brand really its idea is and then you can bring that to life and so that's a very different expression of yeah. societal impact uh, that we make and so we are very very conscious about the truth behind the brands and really uh, who the consumer is and how that uniquely connects in the world and that's where we lean in. Yeah, no, I, I love that. And, th- and going back to the original narrative and what that means to that brand's identity yeah. and bringing that purpose. Such a beautiful story. You know? uh, yeah. Such a beautiful story. But to, but to again, to sort of take that and run with it as, as the storyline for purpose behind the brand, I think is, is really meaningful and, and incredible. Um, the next question I see here is when it comes to communicating with your consumers, how do you think about brand purpose and how does that impact your approach to marketing? Yeah, well, all I would say is, and, and, and I, I'm sorry if I sound like I'm repeating myself, but it's truly at the core the of The question's a little repetitive too. So <laughs> it's your fault. No problem. <laughs> I, I love the question because it truly Good gets to the heart of what we do. And we put the purpose behind every brand that we're communicating against. We're always thinking about what is the purpose of this brand? and how do we best express it? But we don't look at it as a literal translation. We look for the creative flair that could best express this purpose. And we work with our partners to really look for those ideas that are truly consumer centric and are really going to express that purpose in its best way. And frankly, in a lot of cases, that is entertaining and funny. Yeah. And, and so that is how we think about it. And, but it truly has to come from the truth of that purpose and what's right for that consumer and how best it fits with the tone and the, and the, and the overall narrative of that brand. And that influences everything that we do. I love it. I, well, I think that's a, a great place to end. I see Davina has joined us again. Um, but I really enjoyed reconnecting with you and I, I love these topics and these themes. I mean, I couldn't pick a better conversation for today all around joy and chips and purpose and, you know, actions um, more than just words. And, and, and I really enjoyed speaking with you on a lot of these topics. So nice to see you. Thank you so much. Yeah. Thank you for the, for the invitation. I'm delighted to, to have had the time with you and thank you so much. Absolutely. Okay. Well, Rachel, uh, just a few uh, takeaways. So I also loved hearing about the importance of retail media networks in what you're doing. I know we work with a lot of retailers and I know they're investing a lot there. So nice to see the synergies there. But a few fun facts. I did it for the last session because the theme today is 10 years backwards and 10 years forward. So I looked it up and 10 years ago, Frito-Lay reformulated the Lay's potato chips focused on all natural 